So welcome back if you're still with me and you've been following along. Uh, we're working on finishing up our PMO abstract model for the CSL model. And so far we have covered basically creating the whole model from defining the sets parameters and creating a data file. We made decision variables, we made objective function, we created all of our constraints, and this last video just covers running the abstract model and interpreting the solution. So in order to run the abstract model, we first have to create an instance, and then we actually solve that model instance. Um, so looking at our code, so far we have created an abstract model object, defined a bunch of, well, one set and a bunch of parameters. We made our decision variables, we created our objective function, we added our constraints to the model, and now we're at these bottom two sections of the code where first we're going to merge our model and our data files together to create an instance, and then we are going to solve that instance of the model. Um, so we're basically in this uh, video looking at these six lines of code. These first three lines of code are responsible for creating an instance of our model, and these second three lines of code um, solve the model and display the results. So creating a model instance, let's look a little bit more into what that means. It basically means we have a model file, in our case that's cslabstract.py, and we're going to combine that model file with our data file. So we have a data file that we've called csldata.dat. And when we combine those, we're going to get a model instance. What a model instance is, is basically it's a concrete model. So it'll look very much to Piomo like our concrete formulation of the CSL model. And we'll be able to see that in just a few minutes. So the first step in creating a model instance um, is the line that reads data equals data portal. Um, the data part of this line is basically saying, hey, create a new object and call it data. And what data is going to be is it's going to be a data data portal object. And a data portal object basically knows how to handle data files. It knows how to read them in, it knows how to load them, it knows how to store the information. So basically a translation of this first line might be create a new data portal object and store it with the name data. Now this next line makes use of that data portal object that we've named data, and it calls the load function. And a load function takes two parameters. The first parameter is the file name of our data file. So here in this example, the data file's name is cslabstractdata.dat. Your data file is most likely named csldata.dat, so you'll want to change that a little bit. And then the second argument that the load function takes is a model. So basically in order to read that data file, we need the model file to know how to interpret it. And again, note that your data file probably is named csldata.dat. So this line essentially is going to load our data file and it's going to store all that information in this data object. And then finally, this last of three lines creates our model instance. So it starts off by saying, hey, create a new object, and let's name it instance. And then we're using the create instance function of, a, of our model object. And this create instance function takes a data portal object. So we've given it our data portal object, which we named data. And prior to creating the instance, we have to make sure that we loaded the data into this data portal object, which is what we did in the previous line. So this line, if you were to translate it into words, it says basically use the model.createInstance function to merge the data file information with the model instructions to create a model instance. 
and let's store this instance in an object that we're naming instance. Uh, so we have here our first three lines, which we just went over. And these first three lines have created a model instance. These second three lines, which we'll go over shortly, are going to solve our instance and display the results. But before we do that, I want you to add one more line in between these two sections of code. I want you to add the line instance.pprint. And what this function does is it will print out the model that's made from combining our model and our data file together. It's basically going to print out the concrete model. And let's see how this works. So if I go over to uh, my spider screen here and I see uh, this is the whole model that we've created. If I go down to the bottom between the section of code that's creating the instance and then but before solving the instance, if I type instance.pprint, I'm going to comment out these lines that are solving the model for now. So I've commented out the lines that solve the model. The only thing this um, file is going to do when I press uh, run is this instance.pprint line will get executed. And in my console, we'll be able to see our model. Um, so over here, I can see information about my model. I can see that uh, our months set has five values in it. And I can see information about the parameters. For example, hours exp is going to have a value of 160. And hours required has five different values, one for each month. And the values are different for each of those months. You can see the other parameter values too. We can see that it created decision variables. For the decision variable e, it created five. And for the decision variable t, it also created five. Um, but more interestingly, we can see our objective function. And if we look back to when we wrote our objective function, we used a summation. And here, we don't see that summation anymore. It's actually written the entire objective function out. So we can make sure that we wrote our summation function correctly. And then similarly, we can see each one of our constraints that were created. Um, so we see that we had a constraint that was E1 is equal to our number of starting experienced uh, workers. And then we see each of these other uh, four constraints were also made in the exact format that they take. And then the hours needed per month, we also see those constraints were created and that they're all lower bound constraints. And we see those parameters also appear um, within these constraints. So if you're ever wondering if your constraint formulations are correct, because some of them get um, you know, pretty complicated. If you're wondering if you did this whole combination of rule and constraint function correctly, you can always use the pprint function um, and see what's actually been created by the use of, of your functions that you've written. Um, so it can be really handy. Um, so after adding that instance.pprint line, uh, we can go to these last three lines in our model that solve our instance and display our results. So there they are, nice and big. So we'll look at this first one first. This first line optimizer says we're creating a new object, and let's name it optimizer. Piomo's solver factory function creates a solver factory object by loading a specific solver. In this case, I'm asking it to load the GLPK solver. Um, this GLPK solver is only going to work if you've already installed it on your computer. The second line is using that optimizer um, that we just created to solve our instance. In this case, what we want the optimizer to solve um, is the instance that we created a few lines ago. 
And finally, if we want to know what the optimal solution was, uh, we can use this command instance.display, where display um, will display the results of our optimal solution. An important note here is that solving an instance is very similar to solving a concrete model, except for um, we have to say instance um, and provide the instance instead of the model object because the model object doesn't have any of the parameters or any, anything in it until we merge it with the data file. And then real quick, interpreting the model solutions. Um, if we had pressed run in spider, we would get some output that looked like this, where uh, this top section talks about our variables, the middle section gives our objective function value, and then the lower part talks about our constraints. So if we look at this in a little more detail, the variable section first provides all the optimal values for our t or our training variables. So we see, for example, that in month one, we should train zero employees. But in month four, we should train 9.52. And then the value for our experienced technicians are captured over time. So in month one, we have 50, um, just as we expected. And then in month five, uh, we end up with a final total of 68.75 um, experienced technicians on staff. And then if we take a second and look at the rest of our results, we see our objective function which we called labor cost, has a value around $593,000. We see that for our hours needed per month constraint, in month one, we only need 6,000 hours, but we have 8,000 hours right now available. Um, and then some other information we could learn from this model is that, or these results are that in months three, four, and five, our hours needed constraints are binding because we see that our lower limits are 8,000, 9,500, and 11,000, and that's the amount of labor we have. So we're right at those lower limits. And then finally, let's take a look at these experienced tech constraints. Remember, these are our equality constraints that are keeping track of our experienced technicians over time. And these are kind of looking a little bit funny. They all sort of have zero values for months two, three, four, and five. And we actually expect this behavior for equality constraints because Piomo rewrites them so that the upper and lower bounds are equal to zero. And then these numbers with the really large negative exponents um, are actually just really tiny numbers. So for example, negative 7.105 times e to the negative 15th is actually um, just a really, really, really small number. So it's they're practically zero. These are just rounding errors with the, with the solving function. Um, so to look at this a little bit more closely, our original constraints for month two uh, says something like this, where the number of experienced technicians in month two is equal to 0.95, what we had from month one. Um, and then this should say actually plus the number of technicians we had from month one. And then Piomo rewrites this constraint as basically moves this E2 over to the other side, so we have no decision variables on one side, and then all the decision variables on the other side. So this is where this zero comes from. And again, this negative sign should actually be a plus here. Um, so this video, well, this series of videos, um, has reviewed concrete versus abstract models. We constructed our very first abstract model, including the sets, parameters, and data file, the decision variables, the objective function, the sets of constraints. We ran the abstract model, and we also took a few seconds to interpret some of the solution.